Good evening, everyone. My name is Erin Dunn, and I'm the assistant curator here at Telfair Museums. And it's been my distinct honor to curate Telfair's presentation of this wonderful traveling exhibition from Aperture that was curated by David Campany and Denise Wolf. Before I introduce our guests, I just wanted to extend a few thank yous, especially to the staff at Aperture and to all the Telfair staff who played a um, role in helping to organize, promote, and support this exhibition, um, especially Jessica Estes, Heath Rich, Bluton Pavlovic. Holly Ackerman, Stephanie Raines, and Harry DeLorme. And now I'm fortunate to be able to introduce our guest speaker tonight. David Campany is a renowned writer and curator whose work has been influential and provided essential scholarship in the field of photography. When he is not writing, curating, or lecturing, Campany finds time for his own artistic practice and currently has shows in Istanbul and Brussels. We are so excited to host such an esteemed curator, writer, and artist here at Telfair Museums, and I invite you to help me welcome him to the stage. Thanks, Erin. I was invited to work on this project, I, th I think because Aperture in New York, which is a publisher and organizer of exhibitions, um, knew that it was a subject that was dear to my heart. Now, um, it's a show about photographers making road trips in America, uh, really since the 1950s. Um, well, there are, there are some earlier moments, uh, artifacts and things, which you'll see in vitrines, which contextualize it a little bit. Um, and you might think that the way to put a show like this together would be to look at all the photographers that made road trips, and there are many, many, many of them. We had to be quite selective, even though there are 18 in the show. Um, and just choose the, what you think are the best ones. Um, I felt we should do it in a rather counterintuitive way, which was to say, how come some of the very, very best American photography was made on the road? H how come the road somehow uh, is the occasion for making such great images. It's, it's that's, uh, maybe that's a subtle distinction, but it seemed important to me to try to go about it that way. Because of course, although this is uh, perhaps the only time that all of these projects have been put together, um, they also exist in a broader history of photography and history of art. And if you look across the 20th century uh, art history of photography, you can't help but notice how so many of the, the great pictures uh, were made on the road. So that was, that was really the approach we decided to take. It begins... Flashy graphics. Um, <clears throat> we begin with um, Robert Frank, Swiss photographer who came to America in the 40s. And I can say this as a European, although he's older than me. Um, the reputation of America as a culture, as a site of progress, as a site of industry, uh, was extraordinary worldwide. Uh, it still is held in high esteem around the world. I know you've taken a dent recently. <laughs> <laughs> Things will level out. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and many, many European photographers have come to America, not necessarily to make their name or anything like that, but just, just out of a fascination with the idea of America and how different it is from Europe. Uh, Frank was Swiss and he came really on the reputation of America that he'd received when he was young in the 20s and 30s, you know, those, those decades of extraordinary cultural, industrial and political progress. Uh, and he was disappointed. He found it hadn't quite lived up to that promise. And of course, you know, America's promise to itself is a big one and it's bound to fall short. You know, if America, modern America is an experiment, then it needs monitoring. And a lot of photographers are very good at monitoring and reflecting back America at its different moments and refracted through different ways of understanding it. Um, I'll come back to 
Robert Frank later, but I thought it might be worth <laughs> going back even further. I love this picture. It's not, it's not in the show. Yeah, you will find it in the book. This is R.E. Olds, test driving the curved dash Oldsmobile in Lansing, Michigan, 1903. I, I love it because he's so intrepid, and I love, I love the rectitude of his posture <laughs> as, as he's stuck in the mud. But I also like the fact that it has these railroad tracks. Because in a way, well not in a way, it's a fact that the railroads really stitched together America as a modern nation in the 19th century. And one of the unforeseen consequences of that was as more and more people and more and more goods went by train uh, between cities and across the country, the roads fell into terrible disrepair. So that when the automobile arrived, it was without a proper road system, interestingly. But, yes, you're an intrepid bunch, and people took off trying, <laughs> trying to make really quite extensive journeys uh, very early on. Have a look at this. This is just from only a few years later. Um, uh, it's one of a series of books that was published by Rand McNally, the map company. Uh, they're always keen to spot a gap in the market, and they noticed that people were trying to make quite substantial trips between cities. Um, the copy of the book that you'll see in the gallery in a vitrine is, is titled um, New York to Chicago, Chicago to New York. And these books were produced to help pioneer drivers uh, on the road where there was largely no signage, <laughs> actually, and no proper integrated highway communication system that we all take for granted. So what did Rand McNally do? Well, they sent out a photographer to photograph every major intersection <laughs> from one city to another and got the photographer to turn around and take the reverse shot. <clears throat> and, well, it doesn't take a genius to notice that it has more than a passing resemblance to Google Street View. <laughs> This is Google Street View in the early part of the 19th century. Um, 20th century, sorry. You know, complete with arrows and you can make notes and you can personalize it. The interesting thing is um, cars, uh, the proliferation of cars which happened in the 1910s and 1920s, so transformed the roadside of America um, that these books were obsolete within a, few, within a few years. So there was only a very small pocket of time where they were useful, so 1906 to 1910. They were either going to have to keep updating these books or hope for proper signage, which is what uh, happened. So it's a, it's a marvellous little moment, if you like. Um, it's the earliest artefact in the show, but it connects very much to our contemporary understanding of the road sort of via the internet. <laughs> Great pictures. wasn't long before the relationship between photography, amateur photography, um, and the road trip was cemented. Um, you took road trips in order to make pictures, and vice versa, in a way. Um, so that, <clears throat> that condition that really, I, I suppose, reaches its sort of zenith in the 60s and 70s of you know, the photo album of the road trip, um, really begins at, at the beginning of the 1920s. And you'll notice, interestingly, it's a woman with a camera. Now, that's interesting in itself. Kodak was really pitching at women as the... Um, guardians, really, of the sort of familial experience, um, not men, interestingly. Um, but you will notice, as I show you images uh, from uh, the open road, um, that many of these projects are by men. You, there are some women there, and it's very important that they're there. And it might be to do with a kind of slightly heroic, Whitman-esque idea of being alone in the world, at one with the universe, at one with the road, as if you were born by immaculate conception and had no obligations to anyone but your own destiny. Um, there is something of that mythology within road 
portrait photography, um, and you will notice that as we go on. Uh, Io Hoppe, uh, one of a number of, uh, again, European photographers who came. Hoppe was an incredibly um, successful commercial photographer, um, did books about um, countries all over the world, but the American one, the American book called Romantic America, is really something, and his photographs really preempt a lot of the imagery you'll see in the show. Um, and you can trace the lineage from Hoppe via uh, Walker Evans, who starts taking pictures around this time, um, through people like Robert Frank and Stephen Shaw and others that we'll come to. A, a marvellous book here, <coughs> we won't find it in the show, um, again by two Swiss guys, America from the Car, published in 1930. Again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing book because it preempts a lot of what happened in American photography. You probably know about the Farm Security Administration and all of those photographers, Dorothea Lang, uh, Ben Shan was even shooting for them, Russell Lee, Walker Evans. Um, here's these two Europeans coming over and making pictures which really are forerunners of um, those kinds of pictures. Now it's interesting that they place so much emphasis on the car and the car is in the shots a lot. Just as you'll see cars within the frame quite often here. Now the car allows you to see things but it changes what you see. The, the presence of the car in the world has obviously changed the look of America. You know, the observer affects the observed. And they noticed this already. The, these are roads unlike any, and cars unlike any you would have found in Europe at the time. And uh, these two, photographer and writer together, realized that if they were going to do a book about seeing America from the car, the car really need to, needed to be present. It was a kind of agent of change. It, it wasn't just a, a form of transportation. A beautiful map here, uh, a double page from Fortune magazine, 1934, The Great American Roadside by John Stuart Curry, better known as a painter, but worked commercially as an illustrator as well. And the text that goes with this, although it's uncredited, is by James Agee. And it's really the first essay within American culture to pinpoint what was happening, the changes that were happening because of the car. The fact that you could pull over and buy things, uh, hotel culture was changing into motel culture, although they weren't called motels first of all, they were called camp cabins. A little postcard here of a cluster of um, camp cabins. It's a really amazing essay, it's typical AG, it goes on for far too long. Uh, <laughs> And he, he, could have, he could have made his... It takes up most of the issue of Fortune. It's like you get to page 24 and it says, see page 34 for the next section. The next section. It's, it's, it's a really substantial piece and I, I can't help but think that he had you know, posterity in mind. You know, he, I think he did feel he was really trying to define something very new in American culture. Walker Evans, who I've mentioned already, first photographer to get a solo show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. 1938, he rounded up a decade of his photographs and it's interesting that in that show and in that book about 40% of the images are to do with cars and car culture. He never made one specific road trip but he loved cars and was always exploring by cars and really felt that to take the temperature of America you had to get out of the big cities. It, it, it was going to be in the secondary cities, so to speak, you know, not the Chicago's or the Los Angeles's or the <coughs> New York's. Uh, and Evans was New York based but really felt that he had to, had to get out. This is another interesting question about the status of New York within America. Um, many of these photographers uh, are from New York and set off to look for America. I sound like Simon and Garfunkel there, don't I? Walked off to look, walked off to look for America. That's something that New Yorkers do, because they don't really think they belong to America. There's, there's a kind of honorary European sense about New York. Um, I once said to one of the, once asked one of the photographers in the show, Joel Sternfeld, I said, you've done this book and this amazing project called American Prospects. Um, how far do you have to get out of New York 
to find America. <laughs> and he said, well, about 150 miles. <laughs> strange idea that America is always somewhere else. You've got to go and look for it. It won't necessarily be on your doorstep. Completely wrong, of course, but there we are. A few more of Evans's pictures, just to get us in the mood. Uh, <clears throat> extraordinary um, picture here, which I've known, I've known for years, and I, I was reading, I wrote a book about Walker Evans, and I was reading endlessly about this picture, and none of the pictures, none of the writings about this photograph could actually tell me what I was looking at. And it was only when I started reading histories of the automobile um, that I discovered that these um, billboards and the kind of structure that these billboards are pasted on uh, was put up to shield these houses um, in Atlanta from um, the terrible din, the terrible racket of motor cars hurtling past. Uh, these roads were not originally built for these cars and these you know, quite stately houses uh, would rather have... <laughs> <laughs> would rather have a sound barrier in front of them than, than put up with the racket of motor cars. Uh, that's not something you'd learn in the history of photography. That had to go somewhere else for that. Around the same time, interestingly, Dorothea Lang uh, made uh, a study with her husband, uh, Paul Taylor, of the migration of uh, tenant farmers uh, from their... <coughs> Uh, farms westwards to California and cars in quite a dilapidated state appear in that book um, families sharing cars uh, cars breaking down interestingly at the very same time exactly the same time uh, the Ford Motor Company no, General Motors not Ford General Motors sponsored Futurama highways and horizons at the New York World's Fair, uh, the centerpiece of which was a huge, well, it looks dystopian to us now, but in 1939 it looked utopian, a kind of car-based utopian city that just worked like clockwork. Everybody lived in the suburbs and they came racing into the city with no traffic <laughs> to do their work and would, would return home to the valleys and the mountains and play with their children. Um, Marvellous. And you could, you could view it by sitting in these chairs that were motorised and, and sort of brought you in the full diorama of this model. Now it's interesting that that's happening at exactly the same time as Dorothy Lang's making these pictures on the other coast. The transformation of the roads, which was really quite dramatic, there were various highway acts in the 1950s, and old routes were replaced by newer ones, straighter ones. Um, Bernice Abbott, who'd been photographing since the 1920s, wanted to photograph Route 1, uh, which goes all the way from, I don't think it goes through Savannah, but it goes from Miami to Maine. And she felt that the whole culture around that road was going to get eclipsed somehow. As soon as, as, soon as all the cars moved to the new highway, the, everything that had built up around the old one was going to decay and, and fade away and she felt that that should be documented so she spent a number of weeks quite intensively photographing and then interestingly did nothing with the pictures and they've only surfaced recently and that's a very interesting question about what makes a photograph significant. She was trying to photograph the absolutely typical. Now if, if you make a picture that's absolutely typical and you present it right there and then audiences often look at it and go, I don't, what's the point? It's a, it's a food stand. <laughs> what's the big deal? 40 years down the road, 40 years hence, those photographs actually become very significant. Walker Evans was once asked, uh, Mr. Evans, uh, how do you make a good photograph? And he said, take any photograph and wait 30 years. <laughs> This is the original manuscript. It's around the same time. 
This is the original manuscript of Jack Kerouac's On the Road. Uh, Kerouac had made various road trips with friends. Uh, was making bits and pieces of notes, but then had to sit down and write it. And it's very interesting, I think, that he wrote it in two weeks of a kind of frenzy, non-stop activity. I don't know what substances he was taking. <laughs> no paragraphs, almost no punctuation. Uh, it's a 22 feet long scroll. And so we, when he'd get to the end of a page of his typewriter, he'd tape another sheet to it and, and just keep going, keep going. <laughs> his publisher said, you're going to have to punctuate this, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Kerouac. But there's something interesting about the ongoingness of it, the, uh, the expanse of America, the flow of experience, no punctuation, keep going. So it's interesting that the manuscript for a book about being on the road uh, has this flow to it. It has actually recently been published in this form, not as a scroll, that would be great, um, but without, without the punctuation or the paragraphs, just as in a sort of regular book format. But compare that to this. This is Robert Rauschenberg um, making a painting with his friend John Cage, the experimental composer. Again, it's a scroll, and they taped pieces of paper together, and uh, Rauschenberg drove his Ford car across the length of the paper while John Cage poured paint onto the wheel. So you just get this long tire print, which isn't completely uniform because the paint gets thinner as it goes along. Um, this is the time of abstract expressionism, the idea of a painting being a kind of gesture or a kind of conceptual act. But I do think it has a nice relation to something like Kerouac's scroll, but I also think it has a nice relation to this. This is one of my very favourite paintings. I think it's the third from last painting that Edward Hopper made called Road and Trees, 1962. Again, it's this ongoingness. How, how do you make a significant work of art out of an experience that might be largely boring? tedious. How, how do you do it? That takes a certain kind of mastery and a certain kind of astringency to do it. Interestingly, there's an early sketch for this painting where Hopper had a car in it. And he took it out. It's interesting. He took it out. Maybe that's, maybe that's the way to do it. You don't even have to have a car. Maybe, maybe the, the road is enough. Okay. That's a kind of little preamble. So Robert Frank comes in 19... 47, and he gets a Guggenheim Fellowship, and a number of these projects were made on Guggenheim grants. Very open-ended. It's not none of the kind of detailed bureaucratic forms that contemporary artists have to fill in to get some money, or curators. Erin will know about that. Um, Robert Frank basically said, I want to go out and see what's there. Um, and he did, and it was... He was unbelievably dedicated. He shot for about 18 months. And I, I know this often, when you look at a photograph, you think, oh, well, that just happened. That was just an observation, a click of a button. It's, it's true that the craft complex of photography is simple. It's not like oil painting. But to do it really well does require enormous feats of attention. Frank afterwards said he was absolutely exhausted. He was working long days, thinking about how to turn what he saw into a kind of new symbolic language for America that reflect, did reflect his own sentiment. He did feel quite angry. He also felt very melancholy. He felt America was somewhat lost, that the promise was getting squandered on a kind of empty materialism and celebrity. Trolley car, trolley car here. It's quite clear that the faces at the front of the bus are different from the faces at the back of the bus. This absolutely horrified. Robert Frank. Faces are obscured. There are frames within frames that help you think about how the photograph is not just observed, but also somehow constructed. Not in the sense that he's staging it, in the sense that he's selecting very carefully how to make an image that will function not just as a document, but perhaps also as a metaphor for America. 
a kind of crazily busy street in which nobody seems to recognise anyone else's presence. You know, that yeah. feeling you get where everyone's on autopilot, sliding past each other without making much connection. African-American nanny here with a white baby. And Frank goes out of his way to expose the film and then print it so that it's her skin tone that is correctly represented. And everything else bleaches out into overexposure. That's a very, very smart photographer, knowing that even the technology he's using doesn't suit everyone. If you look at movies from the 50s, particularly those movies where you have African-American faces and white faces, often the African-American faces disappear into shadow, unless it's a filmmaker who's really aware of that. Someone like Douglas Sirk was quite sharp about how to light skin differently. Um, it's, but it's, he was rare. Um, so that, that's Frank thinking incredibly sensitively about how to represent what he's looking at. His view from a motel in Butte, Montana, a Hollywood premiere. He must have been standing next to all the typical paparazzi photographers, but just through changing the focus, you don't really need to see the starlet. It's really about the crowd, which in this instance is largely women. Um, so his view is almost looking straight through her to the, the crowd behind. A covered car shot in California, a covered body shot just outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. That's Robert Frank at the wheel of Walker Evans's Buick Roadmaster. Uh, and there's a, there was a kind of baton that was handed from Walker Evans to a number of photographers uh, who were in the show, um, notably Frank and uh, Lee Friedlander, who we'll come to shortly. Um, photographers needed to earn money, and they were, they were actually on assignment for Fortune magazine, shooting mill architecture. So if you find the issue of Fortune with that photo essay in it, you'll see a beautiful shot of the um, building in the middle of the frame. Not long after, uh, Frank is, is really striving for this kind of new symbolic language. You have Ed Ruscha saying, well, you don't really need a symbolic language at all. You just need to point the camera at what's there. <laughs> and uh, he made a book called 26 Gasoline Stations. And <laughs> guess what's in it? <laughs> Uh, he lived in LA and his parents lived in Oklahoma City and as he was driving back uh, he would make these quite perfunctory images of the kind you know a real estate office would make and he made it in this deliberately flat book. <laughs> so he was once asked what, what did you want your audience to think and he, he said I want a kind of huh? <laughs> <laughs> the kind of huh? right next to Robert Frank striving for this new symbolic language. Well, there you go. <clears throat> ah, another one of the interesting women photographers. Uh, uh, Inga Marath was Austrian, and she was a writer uh, first, and then became a photographer, and she joined the famous Magnum photo agency, and she was in New York, and a bunch of the Magnum photographers were commissioned to shoot on the set of The Misfits, you know, the Marilyn Monroe, Monty Clift, Clark Gable movie, which was shooting in Reno, Nevada, and she went on the road for three weeks. She had an affair with Henri Cartier-Bresson, but you're not supposed to know that, and he doesn't appear in any of her pictures. <coughs> um, I find the pictures very affectionate about America. She's clearly really fascinated, and she's making very, very delicate, well-observed pictures. She carried a typewriter with her, and every night in the motel, she would write of her enormous disappointment about America. She found the food was terrible, the architecture was careless. Uh, <laughs> by the end, she's eating raw vegetables and drinking green tea <clears throat> and has had enough of the place. But interestingly, you can't quite tell that from the pictures. This is an incredibly well-observed shot looking through this diner with all these kind of multiple shadows and reflections and the automobiles and the building opposite. Amazing shot. But you can't often tell from a photographer what they think. She's probably thinking, look at this horrendous unplanned mess. 
But in order to try and convey that, I think she's accidentally made a really beautiful picture. This is her shooting a cowboy. Gary Winogrand, a uh, street photographer, kind of bullish guy, always out, uh, always trying to kind of stretch the idea of what a photograph can be. Again, he's on a Guggenheim grant. He, sh he was a commercial photographer, but really just wanted to pursue his own thing. There he is at White Sands. Anyone been to White Sands? No. Yeah, you should go, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Two hands there, great. Uh, Dealey Plaza there, which, which this is <clears throat> taken in 1964, so already within a few years that it's become a tourist, you know, the site of a presidential assassination has become a tourist site, a site of pilgrimage. And Winogrand doesn't know quite what to make of this, but in the process he makes a really extraordinary picture, I think. This is from his Guggenheim statement. I look at the pictures I've done up to now and they make me feel that who we are and how we feel and what is to become of us just doesn't matter. Our aspirations and successes have become cheap and petty. I read the newspapers, the columnists, some books. I look at some magazines, our press. <clears throat> they all deal in illusions and fantasies. I can only conclude that we have lost ourselves and that the bomb may finish the job permanently and that it just doesn't matter. We have not loved life. I cannot accept my conclusions. And so I must continue this photographic investigation further and deeper. This is my project. So, well, some bright-minded person at the Guggenheim thought, wow, he's our man. <laughs> <laughs> Send him out. <laughs> Great. I mean, he came back with extraordinary, extraordinary pictures. Another one there. William Eggleston, a photographer of the South, uh, probably the most famous photographer of the South, a pioneer of colour photography, made a project that rambled on for several years from the late 60s to the late 70s. He ended up titling it Los Alamos after the nuclear testing facility, although you don't see that in any of the pictures. This is thought to be his first colour shot. Um, he's really one of those photographers who are tuned to the absolute everyday aspects of life. Nothing particularly exceptional is ever seen in an Eggleston picture. It's just the way of seeing it that's exceptional. I guess photograph photographers go one of two ways. They try to go towards something exceptional and photograph it. Like a news picture, somebody covered in napalm running down a street. Uh, or they try to make something exceptional out of the unexceptional, you know, typical, the everyday. And photography obviously is very, very good at both of those things. Um, but Eggleston is a real master at making, <coughs> conjuring pictures out of almost nothing. He really thought, and still does, he's still alive, he really thinks in colour. Uh, that sounds like a strange thing to say, but uh, many photographers can't handle it. Um, what, what do you do with a kind of flaring green and a purple and a red like that? How do you organise them in a frame? Difficult. Oh, it's just brilliant. I just, I just adore this. It's just one of my favourite, favourite pictures. I'm not sure how he managed to do it. <clears throat> just the sternness of her face and the total euphoria of the colour. <laughs> and I love, the fact that if, I love the fact that if you just look at her hair, it actually looks like a black and white photograph. Not, not a colour one. And that really sets off the colour. I can't tell you if Eggleston was thinking anything like that when he took it. Uh, but, you know, in the end, meaning lies with you and me. It doesn't lie with the maker of anything. Um, extraordinary sort of avant-garde, constructivist-looking picture of a road crash. Some unfortunate car has come off the highway and has careered up a concrete embankment and wedged itself like a dart under a bridge. Nasty. And Eccleston's there, and, but he hangs back and he makes the picture out of these strange reds and whites and greens. Amazing shot. In 1968, John Schakowsky, who's the curator at the Museum of Modern Art, presented a series of pictures by Joel Meyerowitz that were taken from his car 
And in, on, in the statement on the wall of that show, Schakowsky wrote this. I, th I think it's interesting. Um, the old pedestrian's way of seeing the world, which allowed a subject to be walked around and studied and measured against the recollection of similar subjects on other days, seems largely the victim of technological progress. What we see of the world now reaches us as a succession of kaleidoscopic glimpses, unconnected and unexplained and unconsummated. A kind of kinetic life on the move. We've all experienced that. I think a lot of the time we try and put that to the side as if it wasn't part of experience as if it was a kind of dead time that gets us from one static point to another. Uh, but a lot of photographers got very interested in trying to trap and make visible that kind of transformation in human vision. Um, the highway becomes a, a, a murderous sight almost. Uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, car companies in the 1960s uh, were actually hauled through Congress for their safety records. Um, the roads were regarded as death traps. Uh, the new highways that were built in the 60s uh, didn't, often didn't work very well and needed mod modifications. Car design was, ch was changed quite substantially to make them safer. And it really took this piece in Life magazine in 1969 called The Highway as a Killer to really bring it to a kind of popular consciousness. Lee Friedlander, who I mentioned earlier, I think he's one of the greatest living photographers. He's still going, he's been making pictures since the mid-50s, he never stops, he's a complete workhorse. A book of his photographs comes out almost every year, it seems, and it's always extraordinary. Um, high, high standards he has set. In the mid-70s, he looked back over his contact sheets and noticed that American monuments had cropped up quite a lot in the pictures that he made as he walked around the streets of different cities and decided quite consciously to turn that into a motif. OK, I'll now go out and look for American monuments. And he made this book. It looks like a kind of 19th century ledger. You'll see my copy in the vitrine in the in the show. And it starts off quite conventionally as if, he, as if he's making a record. You know, there it is with its kind of gold embossed cover, the American Monument, Lee Friedlander. Ta-da! There's the monument in the middle of the shot. And it looks like that's what Friedlander's going to do. He's going to memorialise these monuments for us. But it's not long into the course of the book that you start to realise that's not really Friedlander's concern. He's more interested in what's happened to monuments, you know, as they get turned into tourist attractions or they disappear into the kind of messy ad hoc fabric of billboards and unplanned architecture. And it becomes much more of a kind of pictorial game. How do you represent the fact that we don't really look at monuments anymore. <laughs> They've sort of disappeared. And maybe in a strange way, photography has taken the place of the monument. If you think of, if you think of great monuments of the 20th century, they're probably photographs, actually. They, that somehow in the 20th century, the photograph took on the status of what monuments used to do. Think of Dorothea Lange's migrant mother image or Robert Kappa's photograph of a falling soldier or the um, picture of the girl running down the street covered in napalm. Um, and I think Friedlander's really onto something here that he's he's thinking okay I'm taking these monuments as my subject matter but in a way photography and the way photography has transformed our vision is the part of the subject matter too. Stephen Shaw went on the road for uh, most of the 1970s. He starts off with a small format camera, 35 millimeter camera, and then decides he's going, he needs something bigger. And he ends up using an 8 by 10 camera. So his negative is this size. It's a big camera, has to go on a tripod, you can't make snapshots with it. Everything happens very slowly, and it's a camera that makes you stare at the world very, very carefully. 
This is a shot that he took in Yosemite. It's a kind of nod to the fact that many landscape photographers have photographed the, the National Park. But it's interesting that he wants to do it uh, almost as a tourist destination, which is what it's become, a kind of um, vitrine, preserved version of nature. I mean, I guess that's what we want, in a way, from our national parks. Uh, could have just photographed, you know, the mountain range in the background, but is more interested in this vacationing family, uh, one of which is actually taking a photograph. I'd love to imagine, actually, that somewhere in the world, the photograph being taken by this kid exists, and in it you will see Stephen Shaw on some <laughs> promontory under the hood of his 8x10 <coughs> camera. Beautiful shot taken very early one morning. Um, I'll go and look at this print very, very carefully. We've got a really gorgeous print, and it's about this size. And I know photographs exist on pages and billboards and screens and phones, but the opportunity to see a really beautiful print of a really amazing image is really something that only happens in a museum as marvellous as this. And Go up close to this, because there, there are subtleties in it. There's a kid in the window there, and he's breathing out, and his breath has condensed on the window pane. And so you know, you know that's a cold morning, and that's a boy with warm breath. And Stephen Shaw has got up early to shoot that. So there's a bit of detective work that you can do in these photographs. You can just look at it and go, wow, that's a great composition, and I really like VW vans. <laughs> Spend your time with the pictures, and they give up riches. That's his wife, Ginger. Uh, he was very systematic in his photographs. He photographed every motel he stayed in, every meal he ate. <laughs> Uh, this is one of the best of the motel shots. I guess we take pictures like this all the time now. Hi darling, I'm in the Motel 6. <laughs> this is an 8x10 shot. It's, it's beautifully composed. That, that symphony of 70s browns is just extraordinary. Probably didn't feel like that at the time. <laughs> But Stephen Shaw sure felt that there was something in that. Another diner there. A little remark from Stephen. I thought of myself as an explorer. Growing up in Manhattan, you don't have a car. Cars are a headache there. So I never learned to drive. My friends in Amarillo, Texas were driving at 16. When I learned, it was a liberating experience. I could get into a car and have a credit card in my pocket and just go, go for days. It was the sense of freedom and independence that I loved. I found that after a few days of driving behind the wheel and watching with attention as this world kept passing by, I entered a kind of meditative state. My mind became quiet and I became very focused. Uh, if you ever meet Stephen Shaw, he stares. He doesn't appear to blink. Uh, <laughs> he just looks very, very carefully. And he understands something about photography as a medium that does stare. You know, it's a fixed, unblinking look at things. And he found that it was driving that put him into this state. He'd get out the car, and suddenly that change of pace and the kind of crunch of the sidewalk under your foot just alerted you to the your physical presence in the world in the way that the car itself didn't and it was really that change of mode from driving to getting out deciding to take a picture that really sh literally sharpened his vision he writes really beautifully about this if you go to his website you'll find some texts where he describes this another one there Stern felt he's probably the closest, has the closest kinship with Shaw. Stephen Shaw thinks that there are probably 600 pictures, good pictures that belong to the project that he was 
shooting called Uncommon Places. Joel Sternfeld published a book in 1987 called American Prospects. Great title. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but, and he feels that all the pictures in the book, there are about 45, are it. I asked him, I said, Joel, have you got any like really good secret ones that no one's ever seen before? He said, no. I said, all the good ones are out there. They're in the book. But they're stunning. Each and every picture is, a, is just a gem. Um, photographers are in awe of how Sternfeld managed to take his pictures. He followed the seasons, interestingly, again on a Guggenheim grant. Uh, but, but he had really absorbed a whole history of American landscape painting and wondered what that meant to photography in the 70s and 80s. You, you don't want to mimic American landscape painting. At the same time, it's very difficult to look at the American landscape in a way that is not somehow unconsciously framed by the way the landscape has been depicted in the past. And Sternfeld found a way of balancing a kind of classicism with very strange things happening. <laughs> so half the picture's kind of fallen away in a landslide here. You know, there's a kind of car <clears throat> uh, on its roof halfway down, a kind of beautiful uh, New England russet tones of autumn there with this high-rise block right in the middle. Um, again, he's working on an 8x10 and you can't do that quickly. Um, he wasn't looking, getting to see his pictures for months. It's not like now on an iPhone. You know, he would take these pictures, he would hope that they were great, but he wouldn't get to see them until he got back. And he was going around in a VW camper van that he um, equipped. That's it there. <laughs> So he left, left the van, felt intrepid, you know, got his camera out and his, the dark slides with the 10 by 8 film and the tripod and trudged up that hill in the hope that that would look great from there. Uh, a picture called Exhausted Renegade Elephant. Amazing. You know, if you were a news photographer, you'd rush up to the elephant, wouldn't you? Wow. Uh, Sternfeld hangs back. And what's he interested in? Well, he's interested in the fact that the elephant has escaped, but into what? Into the wrong nature. <laughs> That's not where <laughs> elephants are from. <laughs> what do you think you're doing, elephant? Sad picture, in a way. But I, I, I love its strangeness. Now, Sternfeld published this work in 1987, and that's, that's the year that David Lynch's Blue Velvet was released, you know, which has this kind of veneer of a kind of beautiful, ordered America, but very dark, strange things are going on just under the surface. I'm sure none of that happens here in Savannah. <laughs> um, and I think there's an interesting kinship between uh, David Lynch and Sternfeld. <laughs> Look at this, priceless. Such a great picture, which I think David Lynch actually stole from, for another film called The Straight Story. I don't know. There's a, there's a funny shot of somebody staring at a house on fire with no sense of urgency whatsoever. Uh, the way this fireman is selecting his pumpkin while the colour-coded blaze consumes the house in the background. <laughs> Extraordinary picture. I mean, really stunning. But you can see, you can also see Sternfeld's classicism. Look how, look how he's included these three green um, sticks, posts in the ground to kind of take your eye through the perspective of the space. Alex Soth, a much younger photographer, around my age, and uh, he followed the Mississippi. Most photographers on road trips go east-west or west-east. Miss, missing out what they call the flyover states. <laughs> uh, Soth came all the way down the Mississippi, and this project was really a homage to the kinds of photographers you've just seen. So the Robert Franks, the Stephen Shaws, the William Egglestons, the Joel Sternfelds. Photographers often have to get their influences out of their system before they can get going. Most artists do. You know, you look at the early work, and sometimes it's quite derivative, 
Well, that's what Alex Soth thought he was doing. Um, the work was ecstatically received. You know, wow, this is the reinvention of a kind of classical way of seeing America that we thought was lost. Todd Heider made a project called The Road Divided. Um, you could say he is the purest road trip photographer and also the laziest because he doesn't get out of his car. <laughs> but he's interested in that aspect of it. And the car, I mean, he never, he, doesn't, he never shows you like a wing mirror or anything like that. He's interested in the fact that the, the glass is itself a screen most of the time it's supposed to be transparent and you just look through it as if to a world beyond but you're never part of it you know you may be warmer or cooler if it's hot outside you might feel safer um, the car allows you to see things but it also keeps you separate so what looks like these kind of smudgy patches um, are very often his breath on the windscreen of his car and that's that's actually how we see the world a lot from a car, but we somehow try to erase that as if that's not actually part of our view. But it's, you know, it's to Todd Hedo's credit that he said, no, that's actually quite beautiful and it's quite true as a way of experiencing the landscape. Justine Kurland, a really interesting photographer. Uh, she's finally getting her due now, I think. She's been working for 20 or so years. Um, very much uh, has absorbed that history of American photography and, and knows that it's largely male. Uh, you know, I was, I was telling you about this Whit rather witheringly about that kind of Whitman-esque fantasy of the the artist who has no obligations to anything. Justine has uh, a son called Casper, uh, and Casper comes with mum on the road trips, and they have a van that's kitted out uh, to meet all of their needs. Uh, he's now a teenager, he's not so keen on going with mum anymore, and Justine feels that that body of work is defined now. Uh, she's just published it as a book called Highway Kind. This is Casper. You know, it, it, if you drop the colour out of this shot, it could be a 19th century Carlton Watkins picture of a kind of epic landscape. She spends most of her time on these trips, sort of hanging out with people on the edges of society, sort of hippies, communities that live off the grid, bikers. Um, but you can see a kind of mythology of Americana that she really enjoys and this is always in counterpoint with her own experience uh, as a mum. So as I say, that's, she's, a, she's a photographer that, you know, like any photographer now, if you're in your 20s or 30s, there is an enormous history of photography that we're aware of. It's not like those early photographers who got into photography because there seemed to be no history to it and the medium was wide open. Now, photographers are aware that they work in a tradition and sometimes that tradition can be very overbearing. You know, the standards were set very high by those who managed to set them. What do you do about that? Um, I'll finish with some more Swiss mines coming to America. This is uh, Teo Honorato and Nico Krebs who worked together and they, they produced what was first a book called The Great Unreal. I think the work is deeply affectionate about America. It's quite cheeky, it's quite subversive, uh, but in the end there's a real love of the road trip and what it is visually. Well, what did they do? Well, they took every road trip cliche they could think of and sort of turned it on its head so they used to travel with a toy road and if they came across a landscape that they thought required one they'd set up this little tripod and play this little trompe l'oeil visual game with the the road going into the distance there's a note in the back of their book which says 
no Photoshop has been used in the production of any of these images. Well, I think it's a blatant lie. I don't know how... <laughs> I don't know how you possibly do this. Uh... <laughs> OK, they set that up, but really? Is that...? I don't know. It's a mystery. Go and look closely at the picture and see if you can figure it out. I can't. Um, this is a picture called the Knights Inn Motel. You know the Knights Inn chain of motels? Um, well, they stayed there, but in the middle of the night, they made this, which is called the Knights Out Motel. <laughs> And um, they, they took every, every loose fixture and fitting that they could outside. <laughs> and uh, so there is no Photoshop in this one, I definitely know before. Um, and put it all back again before they checked out. And it's, a, it's just a little, there's a little cluster of their pictures on the kind of final wall of the show. And, um, <laughs> It's a little diptych within that. Some French fries at the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and a road that just keeps going. Well, you, you, um, you can either read that quite cynically or you could read that in terms of a kind of renewal. I've never seen a picture look like that before. Uh, I've never known of uh, photographers taking a road trip with props, uh, but with also such a, a kind of keen mind, you know. At the same time that all of that great photography bears down on contemporary photographers, we live in a world where our own consciousness is often colonised by visual clichés. We find ourselves taking certain kinds of pictures because we know we've seen them before. We also know that that's a dead end. <laughs> and if we're going to move on as a culture, things have got to be reinvented somehow. So we finish the show uh, with this very brave and very playful attempt to um, think it through again. Uh, that's all I want to show you. I've run slightly over time, but um, I thank you for your attention. If anyone's got any comments or questions, I think I'm obliged to take them. If not, go and see the show.